Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for being here at this uh, Friday networking of the Air Center. Uh, I understand we are almost 100 participants, uh, both on the Zoom platform and on YouTube. Uh, myself, um, Piero Messina, I'm a strategy officer at European Space Agency. I'm working on the on ESA's um, um, Atlantic Initiative in the Department of Strategy. And I'm uh, very happy to introduce to you all um, an esteemed colleague of mine, Gordon Campbell, who's sitting in Frascati, Rome in Italy, who's the head of enterprise in the Earth Observation Data Application uh, Division. And he will be presenting the Earth Observation um, Atlantic Regional Initiative. Uh, again, as I mentioned in the chat, feel free to ask your questions either during the presentation or at the end of the presentation in the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. The presentation will be followed by a Q&A session afterwards. So without any further ado, Gordon, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Piero. Uh, good morning. Uh, Good evening to everybody. Um, so yeah, so thanks for the introduction. I'm going to give you a sort of half hour summary of um, uh, what we're doing and what we're planning to do uh, in, in one of our regional initiatives. This is one that's focusing on the Atlantic. If I can just share my screen and turn my video off just to save bandwidth. Uh, is that... Are, are the slides visible to everybody now? No, it's fine. Yeah. Okay, so like, like as Pierre said, I'm going to um, uh, give you uh, some of the information on our Atlantic Regional Initiative. I see from uh, uh, some of the attendees, um, some of this is your work, so hopefully I've acknowledged it properly. If not, we can uh, fix it for the... Um, uh, for, the, for the, the PDF version that will um, uh, be circulated on uh, by, by the Air Centre. Um, so I'll get straight into it basically. With, with the European Space Agency and uh, in terms of Earth observation, um, we're increasingly trying to have a sort of comprehensive capability to characterise uh, the pulse of our planet. So looking at uh, from the range of, uh, or the increasing range of Earth observation missions where uh, developing and launching. So starting from uh, back in the 90s when we had uh, ERS-1, we were um, uh, with a synthetic aperture radar, um, uh, a thermal infrared capability and a, uh, a radar altimeter. Um, so we were able to measure uh, a, a number of parameters. This is increasing over, over the years, bringing in things like ocean color, um, uh, trace gas concentration. And with the start of our Earth explorers, uh, really, uh, we're addressing major gaps in measurement capability for uh, characterizing uh, elements of the Earth system. So things like uh, the gravity anomaly, uh, the uh, uh, ocean salinity or the surface ocean salinity, etc. So we're really increasingly getting to a comprom comprehensive capability to characterize different aspects uh, of, of the, uh, the Earth system and the Earth system ecosystem interaction. Uh, that's just some of them. Uh, in terms of, I'm, I'm going to go through basically a bit of background in terms of uh, the satellites and other developments and then how that feeds into um, something focused on the Atlantic. Um, so just if you just bear with me on, on, on this, if you know it already. Um, we have three categories of uh, uh, satellites um, uh, being developed and operated uh, or being developed uh, and launched by ESA. Um, the inner category there is our Earth Explorer. As I said, these are addressing uh, both um, leading edge technologies and uh, significant gaps in our understanding of uh, Earth system parameters. So like say, SMOS is measuring uh, soil moisture and ocean salinity. Uh, Cryosat is, uh, is uh, measuring uh, ice, ice parameters. Uh, Swarm is measuring, um, I'll just go back to that. Swarm is measuring um, uh, ionospheric parameters, etc. 
Um, I think the new, the new ones just coming along, we have biomass, which is very exciting. It's a very long wavelength radar to uh, get a better characterization of uh, uh, above ground biomass and flex, which will be measured, uh, giving us the uh, uh, fluorescence measurements for uh, vegetation characterization. The operational satellites are the Sentinels here. So I think I'm pretty sure you all know what the Sentinels are. Sentinel 1 is the radar satellite, Sentinel 2 is uh, multispectral optical near infrared, Sentinel 3 is giving us ocean color, altimetry, etc. Um, so these are guaranteed. Um, so this is a long term guarantee of data availability um, and basically for uh, something like 30 years. So for each of Sentinel 1, 2, and 3, we have two in operation. Uh, already, and that's really giving us an, an, an unprecedented cap capability to measure uh, earth, earth parameters. I mean, we're getting the entire land and coastal surface uh, uh, of, of the earth at 10 meter resolution every six days. We've never had that before, and that really lets us start seeing um, this being able to resolve aspects of the dynamics of processes that really weren't possible uh, before these satellites became available. Obviously, it's not these satellites by themselves, it's the contribution they make uh, in uh, combination with other satellites. But really, I mean, this, this is a step change and it's, it's relating back to the Atlantic. It's really enabling a, a massive improvement in our ability to characterize uh, Atlantic processes. Um, these were the sentinels that um, uh, were agreed uh, in the original Copernicus program. There's been a lot of discussion um, uh, over the last few years to address gaps in the sentinel observation capabilities. And we're now looking at, and in fact, we're developing um, uh, in, in initial platforms for uh, some additional sentinels. So uh, one measuring uh, CO2 emission, uh, one measuring uh, polar ice and uh, snow topography, um, a high resolution uh, land surface temperature or a high resolution thermal infrared sensor will also be able to measure uh, marine parameters, a hyperspectral imager, uh, an L-band SAR, and a, a passive microwave imager that will be a um, as a, a continuation of some of the passive microwave capabilities we have uh, already. So we're progressively filling in the gaps. And this will, again, be the same uh, routine, high, um, you know, uh, saturation revisit uh, observation capability. So it's really, it's an exciting time uh, to be in Earth observation. Like I say, these are backed up by the, um, uh, the, the different uh, specifically scientific missions addressing individual uh, scientific questions, which I think I've uh, gone through already. Um, and it's not just us. Um, increasingly in Europe, we're seeing um, uh, small, privately funded uh, small satellites becoming increasingly capable. So, for example, ISI in Finland has an increasing constellation of uh, high resolution X band uh, synthetic reactor radar systems. So, that's the image you can see there uh, on, on, the, uh, on the left hand side. That's typical, uh, typical capability. And they're looking for uh, uh, they, they want to get to the point where they will have one day uh, revisit capability for uh, anywhere on the earth with um, the, uh, this resolution of, of SAR. Uh, there's private funded uh, uh, hyperspectral systems. So HyperScout has been operating for about a year and a half now. Um, there's other ones on the way. And we also, we're also seeing other uh, imaging capabilities such as uh, satellite video, which lets us add instantaneous movement to the static uh, image data that we already have. Uh, this is um, probably quite timely, talking about um, uh, private sector funded satellites. The, uh, the Vega rideshare uh, launcher was successfully launched yesterday. That had, I think it was 55 uh, small satellites on it. Um, sorry, this is going through uh, a bit automatically. Um, so this is where we're getting to on, on the, um, uh, on the uh, the, the number of uh, constellations will, will be uh, progressively increasing. This will be getting to by uh, 2026. That's on, that's on the space side. On the ground side, uh, access to data is getting progressively easier as well. I mean, it used to be a real pain. You used to have to uh, go to an FTP site, find a, find a file with a very long file name, download it. It would take ages to download, and then use expensive software to try and visualize what you've downloaded. All of the pain is progressively being taken away uh, from, from that process through uh, developments such as the EASIS funded by the European Commission. So this is basically uh, all of the data are available uh, online and you can do all your processing and analysis online. You don't have to download anything. So just take all the pain out of uh, extracting information from uh, Earth observation. This is complemented as well by uh, customized what we call exploitation platform capability. Really what we're trying to do there is uh, not just make it easy to 
use the Earth observation, but make it easy to integrate the Earth observation with other data sets using customized tools, etc. All in the one environment where all the data have been, um, or, or the structure has been optimized, if you like, for uh, what, what, you, what you're trying to do. So, for example, we have one exploitation platform dealing with or focusing on um, uh, coastal communities, one focusing on uh, geohazards. So, we really, in, in, in each of these uh, situations, you have access to lots of different data sets that are really uh, the priority ones you're interested in, organized uh, for the sort of things uh, you want to do with the appropriate collaborative tools and support environments. That being increasingly uh, available and again supported also by. Uh, an increasing capability in uh, an availability of analysis ready data or uh, data cubes. So we've got the uh, Euro data cube uh, up and running that's been populated with uh, Sentinel data. We're also progressively putting um, data from the Copernicus services in there. So I think uh, I think we've, uh, we've at least started, I'm not sure if we've finished um, uh, integrating the, uh, the data from the Copernicus climate change service in, into this data cube. We hope to get other data sets in there as well. Having everything in this data cube structure really makes it much easier for uh, machine learning uh, type uh, analysis to uh, to be done. Everything it's you know the, the structure of the data at this point are much simpler, uh, and much more straightforward uh, to be uh, uh, for integration into your system. Uh, this this type of data cube can also can also support you know whatever data you have. We can uh, pretty it's pretty straightforward to. Uh, integrate that into a, into a data cube structure to support all of these uh, all of these analysis approaches. So it, this really is you know um, things are really coming together uh, at the general sense. How does this relate to um, the Atlantic region? Uh, I think if you take a step back and think, it, you know, just making all of these capabilities um, available uh, globally um, isn't really that's not how people think. I mean, if you think about the sort of issues that people are targeting, um, groups of countries have common issues. I mean, one of the, 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 the questions when we were developing satellite-based maritime surveillance was always uh, the Finnish Navy were always saying, we don't care what happens in the Mediterranean. Why do we need to, why do we need to be in this, uh, in, in this global information exchange we care about the Baltic? So a, a, lot of, um, uh, a, a lot of the main focus of people con people's concerns and countries' concerns in particular uh, environment and climate issues are inherently regional. Uh, there's a lot of security issues in the regional dimension, infrastructures and developments impact regionally, um, pan-national interest collaboration, collaboration between countries tends to be uh, within uh, particular geographic regions. If you look at, you know, Helcom, for example, uh, for the Baltic, uh, Ozparkom for the Atlantic, it, 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 it's very regionally focused. That's how people think. Um, the, the data exchange agreements that people do put in place tend to be regional. Um, so you know, we're, we're, we're missing a trick uh, if we're not supporting regional, regionally focused based access and analysis and uh, whatever with, um, with Earth observation as, as well. So that's what we're trying to address with the regional initiative. What does that let us, what does that mean we're trying to do? Well, we're trying to have basically this sort of capability for uh, different regions, the Atlantic, the Baltic, whatever, Really to support all of these things. So we would have basically platform capabilities, analysis capabilities, etc. Uh, um, that can, you know, for regional reporting, for basic data management, for regional earth science, for customized uh, regional applications, etc. We should have an easy to use uh, platform based capability that, that takes, again, ensures that the pain of, uh, or the potential pain of integrating earth observation into uh, either operational uh, applications or Earth science, where there's not a lot of earth, uh, earth observation data already used, uh, really, really, really making that that sort of analysis uh, uh, much more straightforward, so that the the guys doing the work can focus on doing the work, and they're not fiddling around with data management or uh, worrying about bandwidth or whatever. So that's that's what we're trying to do. Um, in, so, really, um, from the ESA side, I mean, our our, um, uh, our mandate is. Is, uh, is Earth observation. So clearly, we're coming from uh, the Earth observation perspective. We're really trying to to um, to, to start with the with, with the Earth observation, have the Earth observation structured in a way that uh, it, um, uh, different regions can uh, uh, have access to the different priority data sets and analysis tools for their for their regions, uh, supported by uh, access to all of the other data that they might need. All of the 
other tools in making for that, that region. Um, how we're doing that? Well, um, was let's do one big project for each region, and that will be the infrastructure, the applications, the science, etc. That gets a bit prescriptive from the ESA side. So what, how we've decided to structure it is basically uh, we ensure that the required platform and processing resources are available for each region to address priority issues that uh, stakeholders have identified for us. Given these platform and processing resources, we then agree and we uh, tender and start a number of um, earth science focused projects we're focusing on the, on the regional earth science. So for example, um, uh, for the Atlantic, it's primarily uh, ocean processes. And for the Danube and Black Sea, there's a lot of hydrology and uh, uh, climate change type uh, uh, issues. Um, in, in, in the Arctic, it would be uh, obviously uh, ice, ice type processes. So really uh, looking at what are the science uh, priorities in, in the particular region in collaboration with the relevant science programs uh, that are operating in that in that region. Uh, the same for the applications. We're looking at how we can integrate Earth observation into regional priorities. Again, in the in the Atlantic region, these are uh, pretty focused on things like economic growth, sustainable development, regional security, etc. Um, and eventually, we will support all of this with a dedicated project office that will support the um, additional stakeholder engagement, communication, and planning of things once we've got enough uh, projects up and running. So in terms of the Atlantic, this is the um, uh, the starting website that we have for, for the Atlantic region. That's the, the address under there. Um, under that, so we've, we've, uh, we've just started a number of uh, application activities. I think um, we're just about to start uh, a couple of dedicated science activities as well, looking at um, primarily looking at upwelling. We've done quite a lot of uh, stakeholder consultation. We started with um, uh, and a, a workshop at the National Oceanographic Centre in Southampton in January 2019. There's been several other um, events up until now where we've been promoting the, the tenders we've been, uh, we've been organising. And out of that, which, okay, these are the stakeholders we've been dealing with. And out of that, we've started uh, three activities um, at, at this point in time dedicated to the Atlantic region. The first is um, a, a, an application development really looking at um, uh, how focusing on blue economy. So really, how can we integrate Earth observation into innovation clusters, the management of Atlantic natural resources and maritime spatial planning? Um, how can we uh, support uh, renewable energy developments? And how can we support uh, Atlantic cities? I mean, the Atlantic cities are probably, you know, they, they have a long history of uh, maritime connectivity, but you know, the distances and the separation between Atlantic cities is, uh, compared to other regions is uh, considerably larger. So it, it makes for uh, quite an interesting dynamic and I think there's scope for Earth observation to be included uh, in how, how that's going ahead. Some examples from uh, what we've started. So uh, the first one on Blue Economy, which uh, involves GMB, NOC and the uh, University College Cork. We're looking at uh, three lines of activity there. So one is how do we uh, integrate Earth observation into coastal monitoring programs? Uh, how do we characterise wave, tide and current uh, conditions for uh, uh, as a renewable energy resource and for uh, the operations of renewable energy platforms? And thirdly, how do we, uh, can we look at how um, uh, maritime spatial planning can support uh, addressing the issue of transfer from, uh, of plastic transfer from land into the uh, coastal environment? This is just uh, the plan for the um, uh, the coastal management. So you can see, basically, we go beyond. Um, uh, this is looking at a very large number uh, of different parameters derived from uh, Earth observation in, in in a structured way, and really looking at how this can be uh, integrated into a wide range of uh, uh, applications that are all part of the uh, uh, coastal management, uh, coastal observation uh, situations. So how do we combine uh, shoreline change, bathymetry, um, change in wake, uh, climatology, etc., to better characterise things like um, uh, risk of coastal flood risk assessment, uh, um, uh, risk of uh, coastal erosion, etc. So that's that's one of the things we're just getting started. Uh, the um, characterising uh, uh, tidal and uh, uh, wave energy resources uh, is. Really, we're trying to get in at the ground floor of uh, uh, these, these renewable energies. Uh, there's been quite a lot of work done, obviously, on um, uh, wind, wind as a renewable energy source. Uh, in terms of wave and tidal, 
although I think the technology is really not nowhere near as mature as, as the wind, but we would like to get involved pretty early so that uh, as, as these really interesting domains start to build up, Earth observation is there uh, and uh, ready to go. So we're a little bit early, but I think um, uh, this, is, uh, I mean, this, this really is a, a, an area with significant potential. Uh, and the third one is, yeah, looking at uh, how, how we can uh, support and complement the information already collected in uh, maritime spatial planning uh, to improve the capability to uh, characterize uh, issues associated with um, uh, transfer of marine plastic from, uh, from land in, into the coastal environment and how uh, maritime spatial planning uh, can actually make an impact on that. Uh, one of the other activities is a similar sort of um, uh, mix of uh, different uh, uh, information products to support, uh, for example, climate resilience, uh, issues associated with uh, 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 municipalities uh, running their cities, promoting tourism, ensuring safety, etc. So uh, a similar sort of range of uh, information parameters are being uh, extracted and integrated in a similar sort of uh, platform-based uh, environment. That's these, these are the ones that we started dedicated you know, with the Atlantic Region Initiative flag on them so far. We're doing a lot of other things in the Atlantic Region. Uh, so, for example, we have a collaboration with the um, with the World Bank um, on a number of domains, uh, and one of them is on marine and coastal management. And one of the big projects that we've been in, involved in right at the start is the West Africa Coastal Areas uh, Program run by uh, the World Bank. Um, so that's basically, that's addressing uh, the countries you can uh, the green countries you can see there. I mean that's a re really really big investment, a mix of uh, global environment facility uh, and the World Bank. Um, they're well, we're collaborating with them. Here's this is some of the analysis they've asked to do. The idea in this is we are demonstrating European Earth observation capability uh, for uh, of routine to to eventually get to the point where. Uh, European Earth observation capabilities are used on a routine basis, both in international development activities and also promoting partnerships between Europeans and people in the countries that we're, we're, we're looking at. So, for example, uh, in uh, all, all of these uh, um, examples I'll show you are in collaboration with um, uh, local centres of excellence. So, this is one uh, one capability that was uh, that was requested, basically uh, characterising. Uh, change in shoreline from uh, over 20 years from 2000 to 2020 basically a, 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 a large part of the um, uh, the shoreline on the Gulf of Guinea is at significant risk of uh, erosion both from uh, climate change and also from uh, practices such as um, uh, illegal extraction of uh, uh, sand and gravel so uh, monitoring that is a critical element of ensuring uh, sustainable economic development in, uh, in, in the countries concerned. Uh, also, um, uh, another aspect uh, we've, been, we've been addressing is how can we uh, use satellites to do a more um, or a, a lower cost uh, support for things like um, bathymetry and habitat mapping. Um, the, this is quite a um, difficult environment to do that as the water gets deep pretty, pretty quickly. But uh, in, in a lot of areas, it's still possible to get uh, some, some sort of analysis there. So that's showing how uh, uh, we've been able to uh, extract the symmetry uh, in uh, certain parts. And also, um, there's been strong interest in a, a, a routine capability to characterize um, the amount of oil pollution in, uh, in, in, in the Waka region. So this is not a sort of a, a near real time surveillance and uh, intervention support system. This is, at least at this point in time, it is a, uh, it's an analysis uh, activity. So uh, it's being used uh, or it's using exclusively Sentinel-1 data uh, for the time being. That gives us a known sampling. Um, so we can characterize this. this. I mean, as you know, this is uh, quite a major uh, shipping route. So and we, we do see quite a lot of discharges uh, in this area. Um, and once we've completed the analysis then uh, of, of the statistics, you know, where's the hotspots, uh, what, what's the extent of the problem, uh, at that point we can go forward and figure out how, on what basis an operational system could be put in place, combining different satellite, different earth observation data with um, uh, additional tools such as AIS for polluter identification. 
Um, that's the sort of more operational stuff. We're also, uh, there's a lot of um, uh, science going on that uh, addresses the Atlantic, simply because you know, the, the process of interest uh, take place in the Atlantic. So for example, uh, although the, um, the SMOS emissions, so moisture and ocean salinity measures ocean salinity, it's also possible to derive uh, alkalinity from, uh, from these measurements and we can start seeing uh, we start being able to characterize uh, changes in alkalinity in, in the Atlantic region on the basis of these data. And we're looking for uh, long-term continuity of uh, small class uh, measurements to in ensure that can be maintained uh, going into the future. Similarly, we can characterize uh, uh, freshwater influx from areas such as the Amazon. We can, uh, not the total influx, but aspects of the influx. We can. Uh, characterize that using using uh, uh, most class measurements as well. So there's you know al although this again this isn't something with an Atlantic flag on it um, as fundamental earth science measurements these are particularly important uh, for areas such as the uh, the Atlantic area. So that's that's a sort of um, speedy overview of um, uh, some of the main things we've been doing so far in the Atlantic. That we're getting going. In terms of looking forward, um, where are we going over the next couple of years? Uh, if you just take a step back and you think um, space for the Atlantic is uh, is pretty important. I mean, uh, Kourou, uh, our, our, uh, the ESA main launch site, is uh, uh, Atlantic facing, and there's uh, increasing interest from another, a number of countries in having launch sites uh, in areas in the Atlantic, um, as well as you know, there's, there's a, uh, areas in the Atlantic being set up as uh, areas where we can test UAVs, so free of um, uh, flight restrictions because we would be uh, passing through um, uh, commercial airspace. Uh, so you know, it, it's you know it's it's a no-brainer. The, um, the the future of all these technologies is that they have to they have to be working in an integrated way. Uh, I think it's easy to say that actually how that integration would happen. Uh, how do you do some sort of layered monitoring between a satellite, instantaneous satellite images, uh, a small number of times per day, even maybe only just once per day, with a loitering UAV, a, a loitering uh, HAPS platform. How do all these things get combined in optimal way, and what measurements you're looking for for each? That will take some uh, some sort of preparation, I think. Um, also, there's an increasing number of uh, regional cooperation zones, either economic or looking at things like uh, marine ecosystems or uh, regional maritime security. So that these are all good framework stuff I think we can build on to embed earth observation into uh, operational practices uh, with an increasingly wide number of stakeholders. I think the last thing I would point out is the Northeast Atlantic is going to be uh, increasingly impacted by um, the development of the, the, the Northeast Passage. So that will become a busier and busier shipping route um, as uh, in particular the um, and, uh, as the passage becomes ice free uh, in, in, in the summer months. So that will increasingly, that will, that should hope, that will change uh, shipping patterns uh, in, in the area. And again, you know, we should be thinking, uh, what does that mean in terms of requirements for uh, satellite based monitoring? These aren't the only opportunities. I would uh, identify uh, autonomous shipping as a significant opportunity for greater use of uh, Earth observation data. Uh, uh, as well as uh, deep water aquaculture. So rather than having um, uh, accessible uh, cages uh, close to shore, uh, increasingly uh, uh, aquaculture is developing capabilities where the, 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 um, the facilities holding the fish are uh, deep water quite far offshore and possibly not even on, on, on the sea surface um, if they want to be protected from waves and currents and uh, extremes of temperature. So again, these, 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 uh, that sort of infrastructure is going to need monitoring, it's going to need uh, environmental characterization, etc. So uh, there's a clear opportunity for earth observation to be used there. Earth observation is not the only game in town. I think there's an, a re-emergence of uh, underwater uh, acoustic based uh, remote sensing as well. And I think you know, really the Atlantic is a ideal area where we can start doing experiments in how we can combine uh, acoustic and earth observation based uh, measurements for characterizing um, uh, ocean processes as well as uh, uh, marine ecosystems.
systems and processes. So ecosystem. Uh, there's increasing worry about issues such as marine plastic. That's what we're seeing at the top there. So, you know, in some, you know, we're currently characterizing our capability to detect different types of plastic in different sorts of situations. Once we're able to do that, hopefully we can get to a point where aspects of the um, uh, the, the the marine plastic cycle, if you like, um, uh, can be better characterized, and these can be input into some sort of improved uh, understanding of how's the plastic getting into the marine environment, and once it's in in, in the coastal environment, what happens to it then? I mean, again, that, that's how, how we use our observation in that situation is uh, still to be properly understood, I think, but there's a significant opportunity there. I think the last emerging opportunity is something I think you've been hearing a lot of over the last uh, 12 months is in terms of uh, digital twin earth uh, technology. And I think really that's, that's uh, um, enabling a step change in how earth observation is being used and the sort of analysis that can be done. And that has significant implications for uh, regional uh, ways of thinking and characterizing uh, activities. Uh, complementary data collection platforms that we need to uh, be taking in, in increasingly into account as well. So UVs, hats, uh, gliders, etc. Also other emerging platforms. This is uh, Aquai. This is, uh, this is a robot fish. I think it's one of the coolest uh, robot data collection platforms I've seen in a long time. So basically the, um, the, you know, the head of that fish can be, um, uh, you can have uh, uh, all sorts of sensors integrated in there. I think for shallow water, uh, difficult to access areas, this is a really a unique uh, source of data. So I mean, if you, you know, one of the issues, for example, for uh, things like jellyfish bloom forecasting is the lack of training data. Uh, this is part of a solution to uh, collecting uh, that data set, I think. So it's, again, these sorts of technology developments are interesting in their own right, as well as enabling wider use of Earth observation, getting to this sort of overall integrated way, way of using drones, HAPs, IoT, um, satellites, etc., so in particular for the Atlantic region. Uh, in terms of how this translates into um, specific activities. Uh, we are uh, hoping to uh, next year to start um, uh, at least three activities. So one would be, and we were talking about um, uh, uh, digital twin. Um, if you think about it, um, okay, I mean, how, how do you characterize uh, human biosphere interaction using a sort of digital twin approach? It's really probably not that meaningful to, to look at everything with a one size fits all uh, approach. So we look at um, uh, global processes, global economy, try and uh, uh, couple the two together and see what happens. That's probably not going to be very effective. Most human uh, ecosystem interactions, well, all human in ecosystem interactions will take place in a particular location. So in order to characterize these, I think you know, we're, we're thinking about having a set of regionally focused uh, digital twin elements that can characterize the earth system ecosystem interaction and that can be the basis for uh, developing uh, methods for human uh, ecosystem interaction as well. Um, possibly or probably using uh, data-driven approaches as well because I think it's going to be far too, you won't understand, that'll be far too complex to characterize using a conventional modeling approach. So uh, ensuring that these different modeling approaches can be integrated, that data from one can be fed into another, and that can happen in both directions, it is going to be quite a challenge. But, so, but we have to start somewhere. So next year, we would like to start trying aspects of that for uh, three priority regions. One of them is, is the Atlantic. Um, so that would be looking at how do Atlantic uh, regional, or not Atlantic, Atlantic, regional models for the Atlantic, for the Atlantic region how these are nested and are exchanging data with the global uh, with, with global models and how these um, uh, exchange data with regionally focused ecosystem uh, modeling and uh, human, human, human behavior models. Um, so we, we try and at least get started on that for, for the Atlantic region. The second line of activities, we want to really be fostering uh, in, enhanced use of Earth observation in regional collaboration and development. So these are uh, some of the priorities the regions where we see uh, there's things we can do, for example, uh, regional maritime security, regional um, uh, regional management of marine ecosystems, etc. And in each of in each of these, we would be looking at again, always putting lots of different data sets together into a, a regionally focused analysis capability. 
And lastly, um, I was talking about the, the, the issues involved in uh, integrating satellites, UAVs, HAPs, etc., into uh, regional monitoring approaches. So uh, we hope to uh, try that try that out for uh, at least one region uh, next year. We know we can do that for the um, uh, the area between uh, Ireland, Southwest England, and France. Maybe there's other regions we can try that out in as well. Um, but, you know, it'll take a bit of preparation. That's really what we would like to. I try just to figure out how, how these things can be uh, integrated and tasked in, um, in, a, in an optimised way. Lastly, I think I'd just like, to, if, you're inter if you'd like to know more or in more detail, I only could only, I only have time to give you quite a high level summary of, if you'd like to know more on uh, uh, what's happening in a lot of these things, digital twins, the, um, the sort of AI based applications, I would very much encourage you to register for our Virtual Fee Week, in, um, which is from the 28th of October to uh, 28th of September to the 2nd of October, um, that will have quite a focus on uh, digital twin uh, developments as well as other state-of-the-art applications of AI uh, in, uh, in the use of Earth observation and in Earth science. And I will stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gordon. Thank you very much for this. Um very broad and comprehensive um, overview. Um, yeah, we have a number of, um, of questions that we have received. I just remind all the participants to uh, write their questions in the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. So Gordon, thank you very much for your presentation. And thank you to the Air Center who's organizing this uh, Network Fridays and providing the, the infrastructure. Um, the questions that we have received so far, uh, Gordon, and are pretty much about the um, geographical scope of our projects, uh, and uh, in particular, um, how can um, how can um, uh, well actually will ESA ever fund projects in Africa, for example, or um, how countries in the Gulf of Guinea can be involved in our projects? But there's also a question about the um, uh, how South Africa could uh, participate in your activities uh, and questions about the involvement and participation of Brazilian uh, cities uh, um, in your Atlantic uh, city network that you, that you mentioned. So, the first batch of questions are pretty much about the geographical scope of our of our activities with a focus on the southern Atlantic. Gordon, over to you. Uh, okay. Um, uh, so, uh, European Space Agency, um, it's pretty difficult for us to fund development projects in countries that are not uh, one of our member states. However, uh, we're not the only source of funding. So, for example, um, for Gulf of Guinea countries, so there are there are sources of funding uh, from the European Commission uh, in the framework called GMES for Africa. Um, that is being administered by the African Union. We are in close collaboration with the African Union uh, on that, so that projects we run can be uh, that, that are paid for by ESA can be. Uh, connected to activities funded by uh, the African Union, so in the framework of this GMES for Africa. So, um, you know, it, it's to all its intent and purpose, it's everybody's working uh, in the same project. It says some people are paid by ESA, some people are paid under, um, under another funding programme. So I think um, it's probably a good idea is we've got one guy, uh, my colleague Ben Foots, who is our official point of contact to the African Union, it's probably a good idea if people from uh, the Gulf of Guinea countries, um, if they get in touch with me, I can pass them uh, Ben's contact details and uh, you can see how you take that up between Ben and uh, AU funding. Um, in terms of cities, I think um, if, if you're interested in having access to sort of information products, yeah, great. Um, uh, we'd love to hear from you. Just, I mean, I think we should have a discussion offline and how you can get involved in, in, in the sort of activity uh, that we're doing. Um, for 
uh, South Africa. Um, I think, I mean, we're looking at more of a sort of technical collaboration rather than um, uh, South African entities being funded by uh, by ESA. But I mean, we've done that in the past. Um, we worked a lot about, uh, uh, very closely with the South African Maritime Safety Agency and the um, uh, various other South African stakeholders. So uh, we, we can explore that um, offline as well. Um, what else was it? Oh, um, Brazil. I'm not to be honest. I'm, I'm not sure how we, how we what what the um, framework for collaborating with Brazil is. We were trying to set up uh, a collaboration agreement a couple of years ago, um, in particular uh, in between uh, ESA and INPE. I'm not sure what the um, uh, what the status of that is now. But I think I mean that's uh, you know that that's still a priority interest for us. Uh, Brazil has you know Brazil has a leading a world leading capability. In the application of earth observation in a, in a whole bunch of environmental domains, and clearly, um, it's of interest for us to foster collaboration between European uh, organisations and uh, leading Brazilian organisations as well. Hi. All right, Gordon. Following on the same line, we also have a specific questions about researchers in Cabo Verde, for example. How could they participate in the project in the project for Ma Macaronesia? And another question: uh, whether um, Caribbean islands are covered by your uh, projects and activities? Caribbean? Did you say? Yeah, Caribbean. Caribbean. Yeah. Okay. I mean, to, to be honest, um, the, the the presentation was getting a bit out of control, so I, I didn't include um, the uh, Caribbean activities. Um, so we're dealing with the Caribbean in two ways. One, um, uh, again, through our collaboration with the International Development Banks, in particular the, the World Bank and uh, the, uh, through the Organization of East Caribbean States, and also the Inter-American Development Bank. Um, the Inter-American Development Bank activities are pretty much focusing on things like uh, building capabilities for environmental impact assessment within Caribbean countries, and we're providing uh, Earth observation uh, tools and uh, technical development support to uh, Caribbean entities to do that. And if you're interested, let me know and we can involve you in that. Um, it would ensure you, you know, there's, there's a lot of the stuff, um, a lot of the, the underpinning capabilities, like um, uh, you know, the, the basic careful observation analysis capabilities are free for you to use. And, you know, you, you can, um, uh, develop your own capability, develop your own expertise using these. If you want to be using uh, capabilities such as um, uh, DIAS or thematic exploitation platforms, again, it's possible. That it, it's possible for us to actually cover the costs of that. Uh, in in uh, if, if we're looking at um, R and D projects, so we might not be able to fund uh, a researcher in a Caribbean country directly to do his work, but we can cover uh, aspects of of the resources that they might want to use as part of uh, as part of that activity. Um, Cape Verde, um, I think I, I, I have to check and see how uh, how, how that works. I, I don't know. Uh, to be honest, sorry about that. We're mentioning researchers in particular. Yeah, I mean, the same thing. Same thing holds for for researchers in Cape Verde. I mean, if you want access to tools and things, we can provide that um, access to to Funding for um, supporting a, a, a researcher, uh, that's, that's quite difficult for us to do. Um, so I, I, I'm not sure how, 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 we could, how we could go ahead and do that. On a, on a different line, another question from Eduardo. How do you see the future of nanosatellites in the context of Earth observation and capacity building for emergency? Sorry, I lost you, Kiro. How do you see the future of nanosatellites in the context of Earth observation and capacity building for emerging countries? I, I think um, the whole uh, the whole small satellite to nano satellite uh, developments really open up um, a number of possibilities. Firstly, the turnaround time is much faster. Okay, so it's not like uh, I mean, I, I remember back in maybe like 2007, um, you know, giving presentations and say, you know, th this type of Earth Explorer mission is coming along and people were getting really excited. And then in say 
in 2020 or something. And, you know, that's beyond most people that, back in 2007, that was beyond most people's operational uh, horizon. With small satellites and nano satellites, we're seeing uh, new capabilities, even if it's not um, Sentinel or Earth Explorer class um, uh, observation quality, you know, um, it, it's still providing uh, a, an important information source. Um, so I think that that fast turnaround uh, really lets people uh, start taking the technology seriously rather than thinking this is something uh, that will one, one day happen. Uh, getting the unit cost down significantly as well, I think, is an important element um, you know, for everybody, not 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 just for uh, not not just for developing countries, but I think you know this this can be particularly important in terms of long term sustainability for developing countries, both um, in in using uh, the technology and also in developing the the the, the, the industrial production capability to build these these sorts of satellites and. The, um, the, the industrial facilities needed for, for, uh, for, for this sort of technology are uh, an order of magnitude more straightforward than uh, building a high-end uh, um, high military system capable of uh, centimeter spatial resolution. So I think it, 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 it's it, both in terms of using the data, I think it's, it's, it's very exciting, and also in terms of building the capability to uh, develop these satellites, it, it, it builds an industrial base uh, within these countries that I think is also um, a, 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 of potential importance for economic development, sustainable economic development. Thank you. Thank you, Gordon. In your presentation, I think you, you touched upon fresh waters inflows. Someone is asking whether you can elaborate on that. Um, I'm not sure. Um, the you know, what what we're measuring with with uh, I mean uh, what we're measuring with uh, small SMOSIS variations in ocean salinity, so we can measure uh, areas of low salinity at, at the ocean surface. So aspects of in, in particular areas, these low salinity areas at the ocean surface are freshwater inflows. I'm not sure. Uh, I mean, in, in terms of um, the oceanographic importance of uh, uh, freshwater inflows. I mean, that's you know, clear. It's a um, it's a domain of significant scientific study. I'm not the expert on that, uh, but I can. If people are interested, I can pass you to um, one of our guys who is. So, if the question can be elaborated further, we'll try and provide uh, yeah. a better, a, a more comprehensive answer offline. Uh, Monica is uh, is asking whether. Um, about your views, Gordon, uh, in your contacts with, with regional initiatives about the, uh, the skill transfers can be done in a sustainable way towards the local, the local centers of excellence in the Atlantic Africa region. So about the capacity building by skill transfers between Europe whether it's ESA or the European Union providers to the Atlantic African um, centers of excellence. Yeah, I mean, can it be done? Um, uh, uh, yes, I mean, I think if you look at, uh, for example, I mean, uh, there's centers of excellence in, in Ghana on fisheries, for example, I mean, you know, it's, uh, you know, the, the leading capabilities for, for uh, on 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 that region, and I mean, that that's a sort of world leading capability. So I think um, the, uh, the, the 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 transfer can happen. I mean, I think it can't be. Um, it, there is a bit of a tendency for uh, lots of different organisations that are funding uh, these sorts of activities to um, ignore what everybody else is doing. I think if we can do it in a coordinated way, uh, it's it's clearly better. So it's everybody's working to their their, their strengths. I think. Um, the the NOC led team, so NOC, PML, etc., the guys that whose logos um, were on the side. I think I mean, they've done an excellent job in through their scientific networking and liaising with a lot of the other um, capacity building efforts as well, so that everything is being optimised and really, um, you know, they've built very strong links with a lot of the, the local centres of excellence and 
uh, I think we will see quite a lot, quite a significant um, development resulting from the capacity building uh, that, that's now going on between uh, EU funded activities, ESA funded activities, private foundation funded activities um, that are becoming increasingly important in, in that domain as well. It's not just public money, as well as things like you know, the, the development banks as well. So. You know, it's, it's important. It's important for Europe um, to, to 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 build these links. I mean, you know, it, it, we shouldn't just be uh, doing things uh, between Europeans. We need to get out of Europe and really uh, actively embed ourselves uh, with, with, with these local centres of excellence, whether it's in uh, whether it's in Europe or, or um, West Africa or, or wherever. If I, if I understand Monica's question right, I think that she's also asking, according to your experience, whether this transfer of skills or this capacity building is sustainable. Sustainable in the sense of what ha happens after, or sustainable in terms of can we keep doing capacity building? No, I think in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the impact, in the, in the, in the fact that the, it's a lasting impact on, on the receiving I, 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 okay, I mean, yes and no. I mean, I think we need to have, uh, we, we need to be have, it needs to be designed to be sustainable from the start. So, I mean, it, I mean, it doesn't matter where you're looking. If you train one person to do something uh, and he changes, he gets promoted, he changes his job, then it's temporary. If you train one person to train a whole bunch of people and, and you, you know, you, you, you're, you're, you're putting a critical mass in that can, um, that can then, continue the training activity and continue the capacity building, then yes, I mean, that's uh, inherently sustainable. Uh, if, I mean, as long as the, the, the surrounding context is, remains that the, the capability you're putting in place remains in demand. Pardon. Uh, Jerry Miller, president of the Science for Decision, uh, is asking your comments, Gordon, on the pull from the user community, whether it's a strong and guiding pool that, that is driving the development of hardware and allow in analysis systems or this pool requires development i think it, it does require development i think there's a lot of uh, um you know for, for the people for the, the the sort of stakeholders who are aware uh, of earth observation there's you know it's just been too difficult uh, it's just been made too difficult in the past, which is why we've been developing all of these uh, capabilities and make it easy. Uh, I think, you know, the, one of the reasons why we're pushing uh, this sort of regional way of working is a way of getting uh, a critical mass of um, stakeholders in a particular domain that are all talking to each other anyway. Um, it, it, it's a way of getting them, uh, building their awareness and understanding that uh, this is now an, an awful lot easier. Um, integrating our observation into what they do and, and ensuring that what is being developed actually responds to what they want to do rather than it's a bunch of uh, earth observation people telling the rest of telling all, telling everybody what's good for them so it, it, it you know the un, part of the underlying drive for doing something at regional level really is to, to strengthen the, um, the the position of the users to be in a position to pull so absolutely and that 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 is, you know, it, it's an absolutely critical issue and uh, we're going to have to be working on that fairly intensively for quite a long time to come. Uh, another question from Milton Campbell. Uh, what does ESA or even you personally, Gordon, think about the lack or, or limitation of international water monitoring, mainly by, SR, by SAR imagery, considering oil spills, for example? Okay, I mean, I think um, if we're good, whatever monitoring we do uh, needs to, if it's to be effective, it needs to be actionable. Okay, so um, we could do um, monitoring of uh, international, uh, international waters far from anywhere where uh, vessels may, may be dumping or polluting or whatever, but if nobody's able to do anything about it, then um, you know, it's, it's important to know, but uh, it, we're not going to, we want to stop it. We don't want to just know about it. Um, so I think, you know, we, we, need to be, we need to be setting up systems to ensure that the information 
is actionable. Uh, and then since we're looking at, we're always looking at constrained resources, we need to be focusing first and foremost on the areas where uh, that sort of uh, polluting activity is going to have the, uh, the biggest uh, negative impact so that you know, we deter pollution there and then progressively we can uh, uh, start to deter pollution elsewhere as the technology improves, the costs go down, the capabilities go up, uh, et cetera. So yes, I mean, it's, uh, um, it, it's, it's limited. We should be trying to do the best we can, but focusing on uh, where, where things are actionable. And I think, um, you know, I mean, there's, uh, even if you don't have your own surveillance aircraft, there's ways to make, uh, or your own intervention or, you know, the, 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 the vessel that you detect polluting in international waters isn't coming into one of your ports, uh, there's still things you can do. You, I mean, if you've got information that a vessel is, is polluting, you can show that. And from the AIS data, you know where the destination port is. You can ask for a port state inspection in the destination port. So that's, it's not you um, uh, intervening, but you're, you're still taking the action and uh, hopefully the, the, the guys doing the polluting are uh, suffering something uh, as a result of that. So, um, if we're if we're you know look, looking at international waters, really we should focus on on things being actionable. Otherwise, it it, it doesn't actually uh, make that much difference. I don't think. Hey, thank you, Jordan. Next question is concerns uh, the uh, relations. Uh, between your activities, what you have presented, and the EU funded Atlant OS project by Johnny Johansson. Yeah, so the Atlant OS project is, is a, um, it's a, I think it's Horizon 2020 uh, research project by, um, uh, funded by the European Commission. So it's got a, a large number of stakeholders. Um, so we basically, um, to start with, uh, on, on, on the science side, we've not really um, looked at any of, the, any of the domains covered by Atlanta OS. Um, clearly, as, uh, as, as that goes ahead, we would progressively like to start collaborating with uh, understanding how we can exchange between uh, these sorts of projects. In fact, um, we're, we're taking a more, rather than or complementing, um, getting a project we fund to um, to exchange data methods, uh, uh, workshops, etc., with projects funded under Horizon 2020 or whatever, we've put in place a collaboration with DGRTD so that uh, now um, basically we will um, we will be funding complementary things that fit together and are coordinated. So um, although you know we, we would still like to encourage. Um, project to project collaboration between ESA funded projects and EU funded projects or national funded projects. Um, definitely between ESA and the EU um, for Horizon, the remainder of Horizon 2020 and also for Horizon Europe, we will have a structured collaboration with the GRTD in particular on their ocean mission, I think they call it. Okay. Um, another question um, is about the whether you consider it possible or interesting uh, to um, make the direct, direct reception of Copernicus uh, and Sentinel data in countries in South America, like Brazil, for example, using existing ground segment infrastructure and streamlining ocean monitoring activities. Yeah. Okay. Um, that's that's a very good question. Um, I think. I mean, uh, there's a there's a number of trade offs uh, to be made there. Um, so, you know, one one of the limits of the um, the lifetime of a satellite is um, the being being able to maintain the capability to downlink the data. Okay, and that's a, that. That lifetime is a function of how often we switch on and switch off uh, the downlink channel, the downlink uh, transmitters. Um, so there's always been this um, uh, this idea for um, or for all satellites, you know, minimise 
the amount of downlinks of, of downlinks to, to ground stations that we're doing. Or Sentinel One, Sentinel Two as well. We can also transmit via um, the European data relay relay satellite for I think everywhere in the, in the globe now. Um, so, but I mean, I think you know, the question splits into, into a number of parts. Um, if, I think there's a bit of a worry that if we start accepting requests from one country uh, to do direct downlink, then we'll be, um, you know, how, how we'll get a whole line of other countries uh, all asking for direct downlink as well. I know some, I mean, some countries have already asked and they've been refused. Uh, to be honest, this isn't, um, for the Sentinels, this is not the ESA responsibility. The Sentinels are owned by the European Commission and it has to be the European Commission that, that agrees to this, not, not ESA. Uh, but the reason for not, not agreeing so far has been uh, the worry that, or one of the reasons has been the worry that um, uh, we would be doing too many uh, switch on, switch offs on, on, on the downlink channel. Um, I think there's there's other considerations to think about as well. I mean, unless you've got a dedicated um, uh, near real time processing chain, then um, you're not really saving anything from um, uh, by having a downlink in your own country. Um, and the, the other the other aspect to this as well is, do you really want to have very large data set, the, the issue of managing very large data sets when we're putting in place um, capabilities that you don't actually have to have the data physically in your country. You can access and do whatever you want with these data using DS and platform capabilities so that you know overall, um, you know, the overall cost of uh, researchers of ever in a particular country who might think they want a direct downlink, actually, if all you want is the data very quickly, it might it's probably faster to um, uh, to to access the data via uh, and, and process it remotely on uh, via on uh, using cloud-based approaches. Uh, I think that becomes uh, more of an issue, uh, or, or I think there's more of a gap in terms of them. Um, we're putting in place something which we call the near real time platform. Uh, and that is basically, um, I can't remember. It's, it's basically the, 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 the target is to have um, all Sentinel-1, Sentinel-2 data processed within something mad like two or three minutes of, uh, of uh, downlink or whatever. So uh, I mean, clearly that's downlink in Europe, but you know these data will be available uh, through, um, let's say, for, uh, on, on cloud-based uh, systems uh, for you to use. If you want, if you insist on having um, a, a direct downlink of data um, in, 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 in your own country, um, okay, again, I mean you can maintain a, a tracking antenna, um, and you know maybe once once it's clear which can, which are the sort of optimal countries that would like it, we can. Uh, or the European Commission can sort something out. But I mean, there's the opportunity now um, through the European Data Relay Satellite, at least for Sentinel-1 and Sentinel-2, to have these data uh, broadcast to you via um, a laser relay. So uh, you get a, a, a downlink from EDRS rather than a direct downlink from, uh, from the Sentinel. So there's a number of issues associated with that, I think, um, before, Having a, a detailed conversation on investments needed, etc., for having a direct downlink capability using a microwave link or sensor one or whatever, uh, we should be understanding what are people trying to do and what is the uh, the optimized way using what's available to um, uh, to address these issues. Thanks, uh, Gordon. Another question concerns the possibility for ESA to fund ground truthing instruments at strategic sites and the ensuing operational costs? Um, we do that. Um, I'm not sure of the dynamics of uh, uh, how that's done, however. Um, I have a colleague who, uh, and that's his full-time job, if you're interested, I, I suggest I put you in touch with my colleague Malcolm. So if we have your contact details, I'll put you in touch with my colleague Malcolm and have a discussion with him. I'm not sure I'm not sure how uh, the details and how all that works, to be honest. Um, on a different line, how do you envisage, uh, Gordon, the role of maritime clusters in the use and application of Earth observation data 
for the benefit of the blue economies. Yeah, okay. I, mean, I think there's a number of uh, issues there. I think um, uh, one, one of the problems that we identified a few years ago now was when, when you have these sorts of um, uh, innovation clusters uh, or whatever, they tend to be around particular themes or sectors or whatever, because that's how the, um, the regional or national business support funding is structured. Uh, and then you get a whole bunch of people that have been developing something associated with transport or uh, IT or whatever, and they try and figure out how do we sell this to, uh, uh, into other clusters or in, 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 into other domains. I think if we could um, encourage multi-thematic exchange within clusters or between clusters, that would be one of the um, one of the optimal approaches for accelerating um, uh, uptake of, of, of new developments rather than you know um, things taking two to three years to really get a sort of uh, um, uh, routine uh, flow of income. I think given the multi-thematic utilization of earth observation, uh, the, the, somehow putting the different clusters together um, could somehow be enabled by a common interest in uh, how people can exploit earth observation. Um, so I think you know there, there's uh, there's potential for um, interesting collaboration to, to be done. It's going to, it's not going to it's, it's not just have a workshop and magic happens. I mean, I think we're going to have to uh, think how um, how all of, how all of that interaction should be optimised. But uh, I, know, I think there's significant potential. The other element as well is, I mean, I think this is the uh, point underpinning the whole um, vocabulary of blue economy is if you look at the contribution to the national economy of maritime activities in Norway, it's something like 20% of GNP. If you look at Portugal or uh, Ireland or whatever, it's a lot less. Um, so as we're trying to stimulate economic development, uh, maybe one of the easiest ways to stimulate, or one of the easiest areas to stimulate that economic development is uh, in, 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 the, in, in the blue economy. So um, to what extent can we um, work with the maritime clusters to, um, to address that, I think is, is very important. How can, how can um, both the technologies we, we're, we're providing from Earth observation or other space technologies as well, uh, and also things like the um, the international reach that ESA has. How, 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 can, how can an individual, the, the entities in an individual cluster, leverage the, the international reach ESA has in order to uh, to look for markets outside what might be immediately accessible? So I think there's a whole range of uh, elements where ESA funded activities can um, can connect to and be embedded in maritime clusters that can be beneficial. And that these maritime clusters can also leverage ESA and other uh, intergovernment or international organisations to um, uh, to develop their uh, uh, the global reach. For example, I mean, you know, there's a uh, uh, very active, um, uh, very large. It's not even a, it's not a cluster anymore. But it's a very large uh, grouping of maritime interests based in San Diego. I think you know, how how we connect between Europe and, and that would be a, a very important issue for. Uh, uh, stimulating increased GNP in uh, European blue economy uh, sectors. Great, great, Gordon. I mean, we I think we are already beyond the allocated time. Uh, last couple of um, questions. Uh, one is concerning capacity building, and in particular, um, what what do you think? I mean, if you can answer briefly, what do you think about the required capacity building? to um, exploit uh, EO data, and more in particular, um, specific questions about whether ESA will be partnering with the NASA Space Application Challenge and how, and how ESA is supporting the uh, UN Ocean Decade. I shared on, this, on, the, on, on the chat uh, our, a reference to our SDG catalog, uh, but, in particular on the NASA Space Application Challenge and the UN Ocean Dec Decade, and in more, more broadly on, on capacity building, briefly. Okay, on, on capacity building in general, so 
Uh, I mean, we have quite a lot of dedicated support for capacity building. So, um, it, you know, we have a team uh, dedicated to training and capacity building. That's really focusing um, on, um, I would say, early career researchers building, so master's level students, early doctor, doctoral students, et cetera. So build, strengthening uh, EO capabilities um, in, in particular domains. So it might be something like ocean robot sensing or uh, interferometry or polarimetry uh, or, uh, or whatever. Um, we also um, support um, and research fellowships in uh, ESA member states, so de de dedicated research fellowships addressing particular issues uh, associated with um, uh, with remote sensing. So that's called the Living Planet uh, Research Fellowship. Um, yeah, I mean, we work with if countries uh, identify a gap in 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 their their own capabilities, uh, we work with them to develop. Uh, training courses and um, how they want to use uh, other programs such as the, the research fellowship or our young graduate trainee program to uh, to develop individual expertise around them. And then when these people go back into the country, that, that can be a pole around which um, uh, new research and uh, new industrial capabilities can uh, uh, can be stimulated. Um, in terms of uh, out, outside of Europe, we we work with our international relations. Uh, department to do uh, um, uh, training courses. We have uh, some uh, exchange programs as well. We had a, uh, an exchange program with Brazil uh, a few years ago now, where we would um, uh, we would host uh, I don't know how many um, research fellows in, uh, in South. Not very many, but still, you know, we, we, we were every, every year we had um, uh, a couple of uh, research fellows in our division. Um, so the, that type of thing. I mean, it, it's it's it. It's small, but it, it, it's constant. And then, uh, in terms of um, you know the, the projects we run, so we see, I mean, the um, the sorts of things we're doing with the international development banks, these have dedicated capacity building uh, uh, activities in them. Uh, in fact, we're having a discussion with the marine and coastal resources guys, uh, just saying, uh, as well as the sort of capacity building we're looking at, we really should be thinking about uh, developing more uh, distance learning and MOOC. Uh, type materials uh, to support a wider uh, a wider access to, to the sort of materials we have, and I think we'll take that on board and figure out uh, what, we, what what we can do about it. Um, so you know, there, there's there's a lot of bits and pieces. It it, it does come together into uh, quite a number of impacts, but I mean, th there's always um, a scope for doing more. Uh, what was the, you you asked something else on the moment just uh, how do we support how is the support the UN UN Ocean Day oh, yeah. um, yeah, so, a, a space application challenge yeah space application challenge so we've been uh, the uh, the data cube that I was showing you uh, earlier that's provided free of charge um, to support the, uh, the NASA applications challenge and we review um, uh, Teams, we 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 support the teams as they're, as they're doing the challenge, etc. Uh, so we're um, we're pretty heavily involved in that. Um, uh, in terms of the ocean decades, um, that's I mean my colleague Mark Drinkwater is uh, sorting that out. I think uh, uh, we can uh, if whoever's interested, contact me and I'll put you in touch with Mark. All right. Um, okay. Thank you very much, Gordon. I think. Uh... Almost one and a half hour between presentation, question, and answers. I would like to, uh, to thank you, Gordon. Thanks the Air uh, Center and Jose Mutinho and all the participants for for attending the session and asking so many and so interesting questions. So thank you very much and uh, to, till till the next oh, Friday. Thanks to you for hosting Pierre as well, and thanks to the Air Center for the invite. Very much appreciate it. Thanks very much.